Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me in worship today. Let's get started with a call to worship from Psalm 57. This is Psalm 57, verses 9 through 11. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let's worship. What a joy divine Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness What a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way Leaning on the everlasting arms What have I to fear Leaning on the everlasting arms I have blessed peace With my Lord so near Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure Will you pray with me? Lord, we ask for rest. We ask for a reprieve from the weight of this world and the weight of our sins. We know you have power beyond our sins, but sometimes that's hard to see. So please forgive us for the distorted world that we create and bring your kingdom and your will and your grace into our world. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's read from Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus, he will embrace 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. Washed in his blood This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting. Looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Will you pray with me? Lord, we know you never fail us. You have assured us that we are adopted into your kingdom and into your family through Christ. And for that, we worship you. Amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in this week's online church message. Great to see you again this week. Hope that you had a great week of maybe God fulfilling some things in your life, maybe some refreshing, refueling. Maybe you were challenged by last week's message on the idea of being a servant and, and stewarding the things that God has given us in our life for the right reasons. Maybe you even made changes in things because maybe you weren't. So I hope that uh, you found some, some types of nuggets of knowledge or some types of conviction out of last weekend to be able to use for just growing your relationship deeper with the Lord. This week we're still continuing on with our storyteller series and the idea of um, really a, a marriage feast. 
And this is, this is the story of the marriage feast in Matthew 22 that he shares, verses 1 through 14. And I kind of want to break it down by verses today and do it a little bit different. But it'll, it'll piggyback some of the others in their thought processes as well. But I want to just read it all the way through so you get the whole picture and then start to break it down in the things that he's trying to tell us here. So in Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14, it says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. And when he sent some more servants, he said, tell those I have been invited, they have been invited that I have prepared for dinner. My oxen are fattened, my calf is fattened, and they have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. So the king, enraged, he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they, found, they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man was there, was not wearing the wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are invited, but few are chosen. And so this is a parable of the wedding feast. And what we have is an overall picture. And, and the host of the wedding itself, the one putting it on, we need to understand is God. And so in this parable, it's important to see how it all rolls out. In the first two verses, it said, Jesus spoke to them again in parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. So the king in this is really important. And what we're talking about is the preparing of heaven. But what I don't think most people understand is when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven, he's not just simply talking about going to heaven someday when we die. He's ultimately talking about his rule and reign in our personal life, the, the rule and reign we give God in our life. And he's talking about the way God and those who are a part of him are in his kingdom. He's giving an overview like these are my people. These are those that I have chosen. So he, when he does that, he's talking about those who are fully submitted to him. Those who are fully submitted in their life, in their relationships, in their careers, in their calling, in their purpose, their physical life, their spiritual life, their emotional life, and their thought life. All places under God's rule and reign for them. Are all those places under God's rule and reign for you? It's talking about God's way. And we see that as he leads into verses 3 and 4. It says, He sent his servant to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen are fattened, my cat cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. And so the king here in this story is God, like I said, and God is preparing a wedding banquet for his son. The son is Jesus, and this is a picture of God as kind of a universal preparing, inviting people to come and join him in the celebration of honoring his son, Jesus. So to come into his kingdom, to come into the presence of the Lord. And notice how the people responded, though. When we look at how they responded, first they, they refused to come. And they, they said, yeah, we would be there, ultimately saying, we'll, we'll come. And, and when the invitation went out, they actually refused to come. So rather than just dismiss them, the God, the king in this story, sends out another invitation. And in that other invitation, he sends another invitation. Out of those invitations, we see God's graciousness and how God per, per ultimately pursues us. And the people who don't know him again and again and again. So we see in the next verse, in verse 5, it says, But they paid no attention and went off. 
one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized the servants, mistreated and killed them. And the king was enraged, so he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their cities. So those that he had sent out are like the prophets and, and the apostles and the rest in that aspect. But when he talks about he was enraged, in the context of this, Jesus is actually talking about something prophetic. He's talking about the nation of Israel, the chosen people of God, and their rejection of Jesus himself as the Messiah. So even though it's talking about Israel, it certainly applies to us as well today. Because ultimately he's saying, listen, I've come to show you the real and the true way for people to come to God. And the real way is a part of God's kingdom. That's what it means to be that. The real way is to be a part of that kingdom. So it's not just about heaven where we're going, but it's also about being a part of that kingdom now, his rule and reign in our life. So it isn't about religious works. It isn't about um, religious rules and traditions or any of those other things. It's about a relationship with God through Jesus. And it's by putting your trust and hope in him. It's by us believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior that that's the only way that we can get to him. Jesus is saying, listen, you want to receive me. You, I, I, want, I want you to accept me. We, we want the same thing, but to accept my invitation for you is to come through God, to come to God through me, through Jesus. And what we saw in these, these people in the parable is they were too busy or they were too stubborn. Well, if we're not careful, we get too busy. We're too stubborn to do the Lord's work, to come to the Lord and things, to give our life to him because we like our way. You're too caught up in your ways and your own works. And you've been even mistreated and even killed some of my prophets and my messengers. But I have sent them to you to invite you to be a part of this. And this is what you did. But by rejecting the son, then you're rejecting the king. And then the king is ultimately against you. And it's really hard for us to grasp that concept because when we're looking at that, in this verse 7 where, where it says the king sends his army to destroy and burn the city, this is a prophetic de declaration from Jesus. He's, he's saying this is going to happen. And we know that because about 40 or so years after Jesus' death, we know the Romans came in and ultimately burned it all to the ground. They, they destroyed everything, they hauled everything off, and they ultimately burned everything to the ground. And so Israel's rejection of God's invitation through Jesus is what caused that. And the real question for us is, what about me? Ask yourself, what about me? Will you receive Jesus' invitation to turn from your sins and to put your hope and trust in him? And finish the work that was done on the cross for you. Are you more like those in the story that maybe just refuse altogether and who refuse to listen to anything that would come your way about the Lord? Maybe you're just too busy living your, your life your own way or on your own terms. Maybe you're caught up in the pursuits that you have in life, trying to even earn salvation or heaven through your works or even through the religious ones of things. Like just saying, yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I do this. It, it's the same concept. Because you, if you go for the sake of a checkbox, that's what we do. Or do you go for the sake of a relationship? Because if you don't, like they, people scoff the gospel. Are you scoffing the gospel? Do you roll your eyes at people who maybe are sharing what God has done for them and the change of their life? Are you, are you not, are you not willing to accept where God moves in someone's life? Do you mock those who talk about Him and talk about the Lord and talk about people? Who believe in the Lord. So this is a warning here in this parable. And we can see this as we keep reading in verses 8 through 10. It says, Then he, the king, said to the servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. See, here's the point of this part of the message. It's that everyone is invited to be a part of God's kingdom through Jesus. You know, Israel thought that the Messiah was just for them and just for their salvation. 
But, but God sent Jesus in the sake of all mankind to be set free from the sin and the death that we're all wrapped up in, the death that we deserve, that he died for on the cross. That's the only way that we get to beat that is through him. It's through him to be invited into his life, into this eternal kingdom. We have to go through him to get to the Father. So everyone and anyone is welcome to come to Jesus, to come to his kingdom, to come into the family of God. And that that's hard because that means he came for people who are not worthy of the Lord. But Jesus came to specifically reach out to the unworthy. And we don't always like that in our minds. Sometimes we don't think the same way as him because that means Jesus came for the sinner. And we can usually say that, but do we believe it? Do we really want to be a part of that? He came for people that maybe you think are bad. He came for people that maybe you you despise. He came for people that you're disgusted with. He came for people that are different than you. He came for people who are ultimately... Um, different in all aspects, different, different in how they think, different in how they vote, think in, different in how um, they live their life. He's come for all of them, the good people, the bad people, because those of us who think we're good, we do know if we're honest with ourselves and can humble ourselves before the Lord, the only good in us is because of him. You know, Jesus came for all of them. And sometimes we like to put that in a little box. So all of us are the same when it comes to Jesus. We're all the same. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is actually 1 Timothy 1.15. It says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, sinners of whom I am the worst. You know, I, I love this because Apostle Paul is here talking about himself. He, the Scripture applies to every single one of us. And I think of Paul, and I always put him on a pedestal because, man, he wrote these letters. He had such a passion for the Lord and sharing the Lord. But he's saying all of us are sinners and we all need that grace of God. That grace from God that forgives us and ultimately saves us. So when we realize that, when we can recognize the depths of our sin, and that sin ultimately separates us from the Lord, then we come to the realization how much God is paid for on our behalf. And I think we like to say it, and I think we like to think it, but have you ever really just rested in that moment to understand? Maybe, like a lot of times we talk about making a list of all the things that we've done to be thankful for and to be hopeful for. Have you ever seen a list of all the things that you've done against the Lord? Like I, I, I read Romans, and in the book of Romans, like the first 11 chapters are all the things, why we don't deserve heaven and how we are without him as, as the Lord and Savior and how awful and terrible we are. But then in that is also the hope of what we can get from him and how we're to live our life, the rest of that from verses from chapters 12 to 16. But that first 11 chapters, like that, that can bring a sobering look at a person's life of the evil that comes in us without the Lord. So when we realize that and we truly listen to the words that Paul is saying, ultimately Paul is letting us know that him himself, and if we ask this of ourselves, if we say this ourselves, there's no one worse than me. Let that sin in for a second. There's no one worse than me than me. I think sometimes we put ourselves on a pedestal. Well, I, I might be not great, but at least I'm not that person. I think we covered that here a few weeks ago in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I think, I think that's a pride in us. True humbleness is going to have for us to find the realization that I'm, as, I'm, I'm the worst. And I can't be any better without him. And I think that's a sobering thought if we really sit in that. So that makes me understand that we're all the same and that no one is worse than that. That means I'll never meet anyone to can be anyone better and I'll never be better than them. But the hope is, is that we're invited into Jesus. 
we're invited into the eternal life with the Lord through him and as a part of that. And regardless of how we are, regardless of what we've done, regardless of what's been done to us, the same invitation goes to all of us. We see that that is what the amazing grace of God really is that we sing about. We like to think that the me, me, me of that amazing grace, but it is for everyone. And that's hard for us to understand sometimes that the person that drives us the craziest is for, for them. The person that I can't stand the most, it's for them. The one that has done something so repulsive and so disgusting it's for them, just the same. And you know, it leads right into verse 11 and 12, and it says, But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the man was speechless. This is interesting because the phrase where it says, He came to see the guests. If you take that in a literal transi translation from, from its original language, it actually means to inspect. The guests not to not to welcome them not to say hello not to just be there but an actual inspection so what we see here is that the king comes in to inspect the guests and he recognizes a man there who isn't wearing the wedding garments of the king that the king asked him to wear he says how did you get in here you're not wearing a tux you're not wearing a tie there's no suit jacket on you you're not allowed to be here why are you here so he's going through his inspection. And the point here is this. When it comes to salvation, salvation is a personal thing. We like to, to try and judge people's salvation. That's not our job. We like to try to, to say, hey, look at this. Um, I don't believe that person has salvation. That's, that's not our job. Because true salvation is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So the man here is not wearing the wedding garments. So that would that would have been given to him by the king to wear. Now think about that concept. The king would have given him what to wear. So the wedding garments to everyone else has been given and they're wearing them, but this man has chosen not to. You could say that maybe he wanted God's kingdom. You could say he wanted God's benefit. You could say he wanted God's salvation even, but he wanted them on his own terms. He wanted them his way. So you could say that he wanted the things of God, but he only wanted them for himself, not to necessarily change his ways or his response. So he wasn't willing to put off the old self and to put on Christ. And that's important for where we are today because it's about putting off that old way and about us clothing ourselves in the character of Christ in our life. Jesus says, in John 14, 6, he says, I am the truth, the way, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So when we look at that, Jesus says here that he is the way to God and that he is the only way. And so he's the only way to receive that wedding garment that we need to be wearing in our life. It's the wedding garment of righteousness to be welcomed into the presence of the Lord. And so Jesus is saying that he is the way. So when a man is, has to give account before the king for that inspection, this man here had nothing to say. It said he was speechless because he knows that before God, he is guilty and has no excuse for it. He came to that, that realization right in front of him. So God invited him and he offered him his robe, his robe of righteousness in place of the sin in his life and he rejected that and wanted to go at it at his own way so what did the king do well we read in the rest of it it says then the king told the attendants tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are invited but few are chosen so when we look at this bit right here to be honest this is why it isn't really a popular parable. This is why um, most people don't know it, don't want to learn it, don't want to chase after it. Because this, this is the part where pastors don't like to teach it. Because in the end, I, I think we like to have such a perspective of God of being so amazing 
to the point that we don't understand that he is just. And that's a really hard thing for us to think about. We don't want to think about it. We want to think of him in the image of being like this amazing uh, grandpa who's sitting there in a rocking chair, telling jokes, accepting us how we are, loving us through life without any kind of standard in our life at all. And that's really hard because as we struggle to see God in, the, in that light, we don't see him as truly a king. And I think we struggle, especially where we live, the idea of a king, of a ruler, someone who would rule and reign over my life. And there's a rebellion in me that doesn't want to give that to someone because that takes an idea of submission. You know, we can get to a place where we surrender. Surrender are the people who hit rock bottom in life and have tried and tried to fight it to a point where they just give up. And they're like, Lord, you win. And they fly their white flag and they accept Jesus and they hopefully change their life. But then you have those who submit. There are people out there who have chosen to see the goodness and righteousness of God and they have chose willingly on their own to come into the life of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So when we look at all these, when we, when we look at what he's asking, he's displaying a righteous anger here toward the sin and exercises his judgment upon this person. We're living in a dream world and we don't have full belief in him if we don't think people who don't believe in Jesus Christ are going to hell. They are. Jesus said they were. It is in scripture. That means that it is truth. We cannot have heaven without hell. There cannot be a, a dividing of goats and sheep at the end in Revelation if it is not for the fact that God has asked us to do something and be obedient and we choose to do it or we don't. We like to say things like, I could never follow a God who would be like that. There's no way he would be that way. You know what, I, I just believe in that God has in. And one of the hardest things as a pastor, like I will never preach someone into heaven. And what I mean by that is, is I do funerals. And if that person wasn't saved, like I won't say they were. And I will not try to preach them into heaven like that's where they are if I don't know that's where they are. And we can't do that in our own life. We can't just assume and we can't expect. We hope and we pray. But you know what? We had a job to do. Our job and our purpose is to invite people to him, to, to be those people. And so when we look at this, the idea of a king over our life is just so hard for us to accept. And we have to do battle. You know, the person in that story, that man, he's not wearing the wedding garments. As a matter of fact, he's ultimately unwilling to yield to the rule and reign of God in his life. So most people love the idea of Jesus as their Savior, who generously gives up his life for our sins and offers us this amazing grace that we have. But many people struggle to receive Jesus as their Lord. That's the difference in my mind in someone who is just a believer and someone who is a Christ follower. That's being reborn. When Jesus talked to Nicodemus, that's what he's talking about, being reborn, that we would clothe ourselves, that we would make that step. See, Jesus doesn't shy away from the external consequences of our response to God's invitation. So when you, when you choose to reject Jesus, we know here that in his words, in the words of that man of not coming in in the wedding garments, not clothing himself, Christ not accepting, but still getting there. He's saying, I, I want it my way, and here I am. And God says, it doesn't work that way. Away from you, I never knew you, is what that means. And it's hard because we don't, we don't like that side of the Lord, but that's what it is. And ultimately, Scripture tells us that God is light himself. And therefore, in him, there is no darkness. So if we come into the presence expecting to be in the Lord, but we don't have Jesus, we haven't clothed ourselves, we are the darkness and we are not allowed in his presence. You know, to be apart from him is to be in darkness. And I think sometimes we miss that point. This parable, in a sense, is a rebuke to Israel and its religious leaders, but it's also a warning and an invitation to us and the people that we know. Is just a few things here that I, that I noticed in it that I wanna share. The very first thing is um, when you look at that first group of people that he sent the invitation to, he invited them, essentially they RSVP'd, yeah, we'll be there. But in the end, they didn't show up. They weren't going to be a part of it. And so when they look at that, that means they've rejected him. 
They rejected being able to go. The caution for this is that if we aren't doing that, if we aren't doing what the Lord wants us to do, we're not accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're, ex we're, we're essentially rejecting the Lord. We read it in the Pharisees all throughout the Gospels where they rejected Jesus and they rejected what he was about. So ultimately in the end, people like that, they don't show up to the wedding banquet. And so maybe you've prayed a prayer once as a kid, maybe you maybe you went to camp and, and had a mountaintop experience and gave your life once. Maybe you um, came along and been baptized and the rest and you say, I follow Jesus and you show up participating in communion at church or different things like that. And I will follow Jesus, that statement, you're showing, you're showing that participation. You're saying, God, I'm coming. There's no doubt about that. But ultimately saying a prayer, doing religious things, showing up because it's what you do, that isn't, that isn't what it's about. And that isn't saved. Ultimately what it comes down to is more than even just the moment that you gave your life to the Lord, but ultimately a whole life that is lived by faith for the sake of Jesus Christ. It's not that I said it one time and I'm good and I go back to the life and there was no change and there was no transformation. There was no putting to death the old, the old man of my life to be a new man in Christ. That, that's rejection. Ultimately, in the end, it is an entire life lived in the faith of Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior to the very end. Now, the second thing that really jumps out to me in this parable is when Jesus' servants are the ones that were sent out to give the invitation. So to invite others into his kingdom, ultimately, is what those were, the prophets, the messengers, the teachers, all of the apostles and those things. So the question for us is, are you doing that? And how are you doing that? When I ask these questions, are you sharing the good news of the gospel? How about, are you sharing your testimony? Do you have a testimony? Because if we have given our life to the Lord, then we should have a testimony. Do you have people in your life that know you're a Christian? I think that's a pretty common one that pastors ask, but have you ever thought about, do they know more about Jesus because of you? I think that's a little bit more specific question. Do they know about Jesus or more about Jesus specifically because of you? You know, he, he doesn't tell them to go out and do token acts of kindness, which I'm not saying are not good. I believe in token acts of kindness. But are we doing things with intention? Are we doing it with a purpose? Because there's good and there's godly. And no matter how good good is, it'll never be godly. And godly is what we strive to be. Godly is what we strive to do. And we have to be able to do both. I'm not making little of good deeds and good works because faith is dead without works. So you have to have both. But what I'm saying is that the gospel is a proclamation that we make with our mouths and our deeds. And so they have to go together. We read in verse 14 here, it says, How then can they call on Excuse me. Let me back up on that. This was Paul saying in Romans 10, verses 14 and 15. Because sometimes we don't understand that our job is to engage with the world around us, to share the gospel. And this is his rebuke on why it's so important that we need to do that. And that's, that's Romans 10, 14 through 15. It says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching it to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So this is a call to the servants of God. If you are a servant of God, it's saying that you will truly share Christ. You will truly share the gospel. You will truly put it out there. Is that true of you? Is that what the Lord has for you? So I want to leave you with a few things here today as I wrap up. But the biggest thing is, is like God is the king of the universe. And he's inviting 
He's inviting us to himself. He's inviting us into his kingdom. He's inviting us to be a part of his life. He's inviting us to be a part of his family. And so ultimately the trade here is, is for your sin and his righteousness. That's what the trade is, our sin and his righteousness. So the wedding garment, that's, that's not our good works. That's Jesus' righteousness in our life that we have chosen to clothe ourselves with. That's Jesus' character. And the questions that you can ask yourself this morning on that is, is the idea of, one, what's your biggest takeaway from the parable? What is it that sticks out to you? What is it that you feel like the Lord is asking you to do something with that today? The second one would be, have you really responded to God's invitation for you? And what has God's invitation to you been and been through you? And the third question would be, how are you sharing God's invitation with others? Because that's something that we are asked to do. How are you taking the good news of salvation through Jesus to the people around you that don't know him? Because this, this parable, the kingdom, is, is really likened to a wedding feast for three reasons. The first one is joy. The whole idea of rejoicing and the, and the wedding feast speaks of great joy. You show up and there's a celebration of two coming in marriage. And the kingdom of God is one of joy. And that's what he wants for us. The second thing that the parable teaches, though, is that there is a rejection. Just like a wedding invitation people reject to go for times. But the kingdom can be rejected by man. And that, that man who, who loved the works of darkness will not come into the light. So a certain fearful judgment awaits those who will not repent and do not reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where we need to sit in. Do not reject the gospel of Jesus. But there can be those and there will be those who reject it. And the last thing the parable really teaches us is that there are requirements in what we choose to accept in the Lord. And what I mean is, is the requirement in the enter the kingdom means that you come to the wedding feast in the wedding garments. And what are those wedding garments? The Bible can see that these, it's all about coverings. When there was sin in the garden, Adam and Eve tried to cover with the leaves when we read how, how God provided the, the animal skins. When we read in, in Isaiah 64, 6, it describes the, the provisions from the Lord, but that our righteous deeds are actually polluted robes to the Lord because they're our deeds they're not his deeds there's no righteousness in us except that that he gives us and then in 61 Isaiah 61 it talks about the robes and and the flowing robes and then we read in revelations about the white robes that we would have that those could only enter in that are washed in the blood of the lamb and so we have to understand that the kingdom is all about the great joy and the things to come the things that we can have but we choose to accept it or reject it. And we don't want to be rejecting the invitation of the Lord. And he is so gracious to continually to give it to us. But not only do we need to receive it, we need to offer it up to those so that way they know what they need to accept. So they're not rejecting it without even knowing. And the last thing about that is that we have to clothe ourselves. It is about for us as believers to truly become Christ followers, to be reborn, that it is about a life in faith lived out in the will of the Lord to the end of our days. And that's my prayer for you today, that if you have not accepted the invitation, that you would, and that you would understand that once you do, it is about the old person in your life dying and the new rebirth of the person in Christ from here on out. Father God, help us, help us, Lord, to live out and walk our life in you. It's not what we've done. It's not what's happened to us in our life. It's not even what's been done to us, Lord. Lord, it is about us living a life in you from here on out, building a life on the rock, humbling ourselves in our relationship with you, knowing you, Lord. Our salvation is wrapped up in knowing you, and in knowing you, those righteous deeds should naturally come out of our life because our heart is for you and your ways. Lord, help us to rest in that. Help us to be that. Encourage us and strengthen us to live it. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to this week's online message. Hope to see you next time.